Good morning, this is Dean Neely. I'm the Deputy Chief Pilot at the Armstrong Flight Research Center out in Southern California with NASA. Uh, this morning, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about airborne science and particularly the ER-2, the high altitude aircraft that we use uh, that's still the highest aircraft in the world. So we use that uh, and several other aircraft to take science instruments up through the Earth's atmosphere in different environments and be able to study the composition, the effects, the movement of the uh, air in our atmosphere, cloud formations, aerosols, pollution, things like that, all the way down to looking at the uh, topography, the Earth's surface, and small changes in that surface uh, based on either uh, flooding, erosion, uh, glacier movements, volcanoes, earthquake, fault lines, things like that. So we study everything inside the Earth's atmosphere from the very top at the edge all the way down to the Earth's surface. And we use a variety of aircraft uh, with different instruments strapped on them to do that. So today I'll talk to you for a few minutes about some of that. Um, here in, uh, with the airborne science mission that we have, which is a little bit different than flight test and aircraft development, uh, we use everything from the ER-2, which operates at the top of the Earth's atmosphere, and we also fly Gulfstream G3s, a small business jet with uh, synthetic aperture radar uh, underneath that looks down at the Earth's surface. Uh, and can look through clouds and everything. And then we also use a DC-8. It's a large aircraft, a flying laboratory that we can fly at all altitudes, uh, mostly with instruments that are uh, sampling uh, air, uh, high and low altitude. And then we also have a uh, another aircraft, which is a 747 Special Performance that has a big German telescope that sticks out the back. That one actually looks up and out of the Earth's atmosphere, out in other galaxies where we discover new bodies and things like that, and star formations, and see how they behave, and these are many, many light years away. So that's an exciting aircraft as well. Uh, today I'll focus on the ER-2, our high altitude aircraft. It's a single seat air airplane based on the, uh, the Air Force U-2 built by Lockheed. Um, so it's a small, airport, uh, small airplane, small cockpit, very long wings on it so that it can still produce lift way up high in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and it's got a very strong engine in it. Uh, no afterburner, but enough power on the ground where it's almost a one-to-one -one thrust to weight ratio. I mean, there's almost as much thrust as there is weight of the aircraft. So when we take off at sea level, it goes straight up. Uh, it's an amazing experience uh, when you first take off. Uh, one of the challenges that we have, since we fly so high, it flies above 70,000 feet. So we're about 13 miles above the Earth's atmosphere when we fly this aircraft. And because of that, there's not much air pressure up there. So to keep all the uh, liquid in our body together, almost as if you're in outer space on the moon or something like that, we've got to wear a space suit. So this full pressure suit keeps everything together. And, uh, but it causes a few uh, challenges in the cockpit as well. Normally on a regular aircraft, we would fly with a headset and microphone like you'd see on an airliner or a general aviation aircraft. Um, some aircraft, uh, we may have to wear a helmet and a mask like this one uh, for, uh, with an oxygen supplied to us uh, for high performance mostly. Uh, if we're flying the ER-2 in the lower atmosphere, we'll fly with this helmet in a normal flight suit like I'm wearing now. And um, that will give us protection in case we had to use the ejection seat uh, if we were having a bad day out there. Normally, we're doing a science mission where we want to take the airplane and the set of science instruments way up high to look uh, down through uh, clouds and uh, aerosol formations and the flow through the air and how those behave uh, together. Then we're going to wear this full space suit here. In that case, we have a little more robust helmet like this one um, that goes along with the spacesuit. It's got oxygen leads that go uh, through the back of the aircraft uh, or the back of the helmet and plug into the aircraft. Some of the problems that we have with that is in the spacesuit, you can't hear anything, feel anything. Um, you, you can't smell. It takes all of your senses away. So there's a real kind of a claustrophobic feeling you can get. And that gets a little bit exciting at times. And uh, some people really wouldn't like it. So the few of us that fly this aircraft, 
for NASA, we have to really enjoy being in that environment. And it is very exciting and uh, I've been doing it for years and really love it. Um, when we put uh, the spacesuit on, our gloves are very cumbersome. Uh, this one here is one of mine. And um, you can see that wearing this, it's very difficult to feel anything. You don't have a real sense of touch uh, for details, pushing small buttons, uh, using the flight controls, things like that. Trying to write with a pencil or something like that is very challenging. Um, another issue that we've got that we have to get past is uh, how do you uh, eat food or drink water uh, during a long mission, because uh, we can be up there for eight to 10 hours, uh, sitting still, strapped into an ejection seat with a parachute, and not much room to move around. Uh, I'm a small person, and with the spacesuit on, my shoulders touch the sides of the, uh, the canopy, and so it's very cramped in there. So with all those hours wearing this suit, you're not gonna be able to move your arms and legs very much, and that can be a problem. To eat and drink, typically, We'll use a water bottle like this that sits back behind the ejection seat with a modified straw that can go through the small bladder in the space helmet. I'll show you that real quick. That's this little port right here that allows us to put the straw in there and then that way we're able to get the straw into our mouth and uh, take sips of water without compromising the suit. The other thing that we do, if you want something to eat, we have tube food that comes in this small tube. It looks like a tube of toothpaste. And then we put an adapter, this, uh, this uh, hard straw on it, and do the same thing. It goes through the same bladder. And uh, through that port, we're able to squeeze uh, liquefied food. It's almost like baby food, really, into our mouth. And that's how we eat during a long flight. So a few challenges that come with that. The exciting part is taking all these challenges together and being able to still fly, operate the aircraft in a challenging environment, way up high where the air is very thin, uh, makes it very rewarding as well. And that's why most of the NASA research pilots that fly this aircraft and, and the others really enjoy the challenge and the variety of what we do when we go to work each day. And that's uh, something I wouldn't trade for anything, and I feel very fortunate that I was able to uh, participate with this kind of an operation and uh, the great people that we work with every day in airborne science. So thanks for the time today, and I uh, hope this uh, gave you a little bit of information and insight into what we do at the NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center and supporting airborne science.